noise by me or is it okay? It's fine. Okay. And you're live. Hi, Mike Zipser with another fast forward Zoom, whatever they are thing. And with me is Sarah Pinsker. Sarah, welcome to Fast Forward. Thanks, Mike. I should say award winning author, Sarah Pinsker, because you've won many and you are up for hundreds of awards this year. A couple, a couple. <laughs> a couple. That must be pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um... You know, anytime you you work really hard on something and then it's out of your hands, so you you do the best you can, and then and then it's in the hands of people, you know, to to read it and and decide what they thought. So I'm I'm just honored and flattered every time it, it turns up on on a either book or any story turns up on a on a ballot. It means it means someone has read it and responded to it. So I'm always always grateful for that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, how are things in Baltimore during our pandemic? Uh, well, in this tiny corner of Baltimore, they're, they're, <laughs> they're not, not so bad. Um, I, I have a couple of blocks that I, that I walk very happily, and uh, I've, I've had a lot to do. So. Yeah, see, as a writer, I guess, it really doesn't make much difference in your workaday world. Yeah, the, the big change was I was teaching for the first time and uh, I had a college class and, and so it went online halfway through the semester. And uh, that, was, that was a big change for everyone. So, so um, the, it was a learning curve for the students and for me. And uh, that, was, that was definitely odd. But, but the writing side of things, I had the same things due that would have, that were due beforehand and I still had the same deadlines and, and so you make, you make it work. Yeah. So um, do you, what, is, what is it you miss the most? Cause I've been asking people this about the lockdown and the quarantining. Is there something you miss more than anything else? Uh, more, uh, no, I, I mean, I think I'm in the same boat as, as a lot of, of my colleagues in in missing uh the cons i i you know i had a i had what i thought was a fairly light semester uh, a light season coming which was not light at all in in retrospect uh, but but you know watching all all of the cons fall one by one um rightly so they've all made the right it's it's the right decision um but it's it's still sad not to know that that we won't be able to see people and to do i, I think some of the cons that are trying online things or making valiant efforts and I'll, I'll be there to support them. But the, there, there's, there's aspects of being at a con that won't, that necessarily can't be part of that. Um, and I guess the other thing I'll add is playing music with other people. I'm just, uh, I, I'm grateful for everyone who's playing solo concerts in their living room that I get to hear now, but, but I am desperately craving playing music with others. Yeah, because um, I was wondering, because that was something we haven't been talking to anybody that's a musician. This must have also been doing really messing up the, the musical career. I, I mean, mine was on hold in any case, because I've been doing writing stuff. Uh, but it, for, for a lot of my friends, it's, it's devastating. The, you know, wh whether they're professional touring musicians or whether it's a side thing, or whether I have friends who may make their living doing uh, retirement communities and and schools and libraries, and you know it's it's not just the the stadiums that are closed, and it's not just the musicians who are suffering. It's the um, uh, sound people, and and yeah, there, there's a whole ecosystem that I'm. I'm very concerned about in a different way than than being concerned about the publishing ecosystem uh, yeah. since, since people are still able to read but the whether whether the venues will still be there when we come out of this is is something I'm very worried about yeah because it, it's gonna be it's like a lot of you know they're small businesses in a lot of ways and a lot of businesses I think are gonna fall by the wayside because they just don't don't have the reserves mm -hmm. and and so you're let's talk let's start a little bit talk about your band stalking horses 
it's because it, it's a rock band uh, it is a rock band and uh we we had been on on a bit of a hiatus for the last couple of years while i was uh running into deadlines and um my uh my drummer got sick and passed away in in uh december so so we were actually in a in a different existential crisis uh when all of this hit in any case uh the last show that i oh thank you um yeah the last show that i played was his uh we played his memorial with his with his brother on drums uh in his place which was absolutely devastating um and we had been chatting with him about continuing with us. Uh, and I, I can't really think of anyone else who could, who, who we would be willing to let fill that space. But um, obviously that's on hold right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, your, your latest novel, your first novel, uh, Song for a New Day, is up for a Nebula Award, which is exciting. Great book. I loved it. We talked about it uh, at one point. Um, one of the things I found fascinating in it, because it's, well, let's, let me go back. <laughs> it has, it's almost prophetical <laughs> in that the, the near future you have in it, there's no uh, groups of people or, you know, it's got the, the kind of a lockdown going on, but it's really more from terrorist bombings, even though there is a pandemic in it. There's a lot of stuff that happens right at once and combines into the government saying you would be safer indoors. Uh, so, so it's a different situation than the one we're in where we're being asked to stay indoors um, to help other people. I think there's a, the, the thing that we're doing right now is, a, in my opinion, a profound act of compassion for for uh, healthcare workers and for uh, people, uh, people who may have more risk factors, and and for for everyone to to get a chance to um, to survive. Um, and in the book, it's it's more of a fear thing, and people are asked to go inside and asked to trade their freedom for for safety, uh, and their uh, so it's a, it's a different situation, um, but with, with some eerie similarities. <laughs> uh, uh, people have been sending me individual lines from my, from my own book that I don't remember. You know, you, you write the book and then it's the, the length of time that goes by between it when you write it and when it actually gets published is such that uh, you know what goes on in it, but sometimes you forget individual lines. And the one, the one I had no memory of writing was the one in which uh, someone says, so what is this uh, sickness that's going around? And someone else responds, I don't know. They're just telling us to, to stay home and wash our hands. Um, <laughs> and I do not remember writing that. Uh, but it all, it all kind of stems out of Log there's a lot of like it's not prophecy it's just logical progressions of things working in the near future uh you sometimes get it right and uh i seem to have gotten some stuff strangely right but yeah and the, the what I, one of the things i love about what you did in the book was your two point of view characters that are on kind of not quite opposite sides but kind of are, because <laughs> uh, one of them is a musician. And at the beginning of the book, her career takes a nosedive because she, you know, is there when there's, you know, bomb threats and stuff happening with her band. And um, by the way, you, her name is Loose Cannon. <laughs> it's a name she chose. It's a, it's a stage name that she chose. Great name. Thank you. <laughs> It took me a while before all of a sudden I went, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, so is there any of you in her? Um, the me that's in her, some of her reaction to, to playing music, uh, some of her, some of her uh, experiences of, of live music. Uh, that, that was, 
something I worked really hard to get right, but I pulled out of out of out of the things that playing music does for me, and then exaggerated a, a little bit. Yeah, because a lot of what I, one of the things I saw was a lot of musicians love the book, so you must have caught it right. Yeah, yeah, I I I think that's a thing that that I've I'm really happy to have have figured out at least a key to not the key to but it's um it's it's something that that uh I, I think if you connect with the the feeling of playing the music and the feeling of what it's like to be in the audience and you skip the parts about actually describing the music itself you you, you kind of come to this point where people can uh overlay their own experiences yeah, because I'm I'm not a musician in any way, but it gave me a feeling of what it was like to play live music and with a band and in front of an audience. And there were similarities because I've done theater, mm -hmm. um, and there were similarities to that feeling as well as as working. You know, you're working with other people towards a goal, and you're getting feedback from other people that are watching it. And you, it captured, some, you know, that, and I, I love that in the book. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and and there's a similar a similarity with theater as well in the rush of will we pull this thing off? Yeah. Uh, you know that that it can always it can always go right and it can always go wrong and and there are ways to paper over the wrong, but but there there's this thrill in in actually pulling it off. Yeah. Yeah, of walking that that kind of edge of doing it live. Yeah. Now the other character is Rosemary, who's very different because um, she's in works for a tech company, ends up working for a tech company that, and we haven't seen this yet, but it might happen that that do kind of hologram live concerts. How would you describe it? Uh, virtual reality concerts and, and uh, they they do exist at this point um, but they aren't quite the household thing that they are in the book and it's really interesting because her job is to go out and find bands and so her point of view on things is very different and it's fascinating to see both sides of this because she was also born after everything happened so she's got a completely different take on what's going on in society and that i found that fascinating and i assume this was a something you did specifically yeah i mean i thought it would be an interesting counterpoint to have a character who not only i mean the obvious counterpoint to to Luce's would be someone who grew up never knowing any other way. But I, but I also thought it was interesting writing a character who didn't mind it either. Like it was, it was yes, it was the thing that she knew, but she also could see advantages to it. And and I worked in the book to to show where where there were some things that had gotten better. I I, I feel like you can also see that around us right now too. There are certain things that that we've shown we can do now if if we if we want to uh, and people we can take care of who we were not taking care of if we want to and it's a question of as a society if we want to do those things um, so, so I think those are always interesting questions too um, what, what you do once you've once you've taken some of those genies out of their bottles yeah the key thing is if we want to <laughs> right yeah and there's also, you know, that you mentioned about the fact that to her, there's good things because the book isn't really a dystopia in a lot of ways. I never thought of it that way. It got labeled that way. But but um, yeah. I mean, it, clearly it is a dystopic society in many ways, but I didn't put the dystopia label on it until people started doing that. And, and there's hope in it. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a very hopeful book. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's you know with the point of view carries and everything i love i love the the fact that the, you have you know major queer characters in it like both of the so you've got that whole 
aspect of lives going on and it's just a cool book and it's relevant today in terms of you know what happens with the creative process under stress and you're seeing a lot of that now for sure yeah so um there's things in there with you have other you have where there's basic uh income universal income for people so the world building how how i'm sure you spent a lot of time going through to build this world and pull it all together because it felt real and what kind of research did you do you do for this because i know a lot of writers love the research uh you know it's far enough back that i, I can't actually say a ton of what it was uh, i did definitely look at the viability of of um universal income uh and and that did make sense as i mean a lot of what i did was stemmed out of the question of how how would this society work and just poking at the edges of that and trying to figure out how how, how everything would be able to maintain um but I, yeah, I, I mean, I remember some of the research for the original short story and trying to figure out, uh, it was everything from like how to convert an engine to biodiesel to, um, to yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure uh, at this point, though. <laughs> I, I can't quite remember all of it. I've, I've got my brains too much in the next book, so. Well, can we talk anything about the new book you're working on? I haven't, I haven't figured out how much I'm allowed to say yet. Um, <laughs> it's, I can say it's, uh, it's near future. Um, I, I believe it will be out next year. Um, and it is near, um, a different near future. Uh, I would argue less dystopic, but people will argue in any case. And it's about uh, one, technology that becomes ubiquitous and how it affects one fam the the different members of a family that, uh, differently. Oh, that sounds interesting. Sounds cool. And and it'll let us know something else we'll need to worry about in the future because you're obviously a <laughs> That's what prophet. people keep asking me. They, <laughs> yes. say, they say, tell me what your next book is about so I can go the other I, way. <laughs> so I can be prepared. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, you had been you were known before Song for a New Day for your short fiction. You'd won all kinds of awards for it, nominations and, you know, Sturgeon Awards and stuff like that. Um, was it difficult to move from writing the short fiction into writing novels? Mm -hmm. I still think of myself as a short fiction writer. I, I mean, I, that's where my heart lies, but there is something kind of delicious and expanding too. Um, it, it's a the the way I compare it. I, I've I've been using a a generation ship analogy, like like writing a relationship because there's this endless middle part, um, <laughs> and that you have to sort of have the hope that the you will get through that to to another side, and that it won't just be. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, it turns out people might be onto something with that whole uh, plot thing, but but uh, it, it it did turn out to be useful. So I, I may split the difference in the future. But but um, I think my fear had always been that if you if you put everything on the page in eight thousand words of of plotting, then what? Uh, why do you need to write it in? You know, why do you need a hundred thousand words if you can do it in eight? Um, but I've come around. It's it's not the same thing, and and there's a lot of room for all the stuff around that. And it's kind of fun to to meander a little bit the the way a novel has room to that a, a story doesn't. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's chat a little bit about some of your short work then. Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, the blur in the corner of your eye is nominated for best novelette, I believe for the nebulas that's a hell of a story um and it, it's about a writer and so i'm wondering is there anything about her that comes from you not that you've had some kind of alien thing living inside <laughs> you but 
spoiler. In terms of the um, way the way she works and do you have an assistant like that? <laughs> no, no, she uh, she is not like me. I was just playing around with the whole uh, Jessica Fletcher, all of the uh, um, what's her name, Ms. Fisher, all of those people who who you know they always they often have an assistant uh, who is probably the safest person in the town, and then just everyone else drops dead around them, uh, and I. I the, the, some of these are, you know, theories that have been around for years, but it's fun to play with them. I, I like, I like playing with tropes sometimes, and and horror tropes are particularly fun, and mystery tropes are fun. Um, so, so I was, I was entertained, uh, it, but she's not me in any way uh, that I can think of. I, I, I do. I guess I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there are some people who know what the cabin is, but. But um, the the cabin exists in a real place. But other than that, yeah, yeah, it was just a neat. It just did not go where I thought it was going, <laughs> which I always like. Yeah, um, I've been. I, I have to apologize to people that that I have. I have a few kind of darker stories in a row. The ones that I've written in the last couple of years. There's that one, and the one that's coming in uh, tour.com in June. Uh, is also a, a little bit darker and and I always feel guilty when I do those because I, I feel like I've promised to be somewhat of a hopeful writer and then and then every once in a while I have to get these dark things off of off of my chest but um, yeah. but they're they're usually kind of a fun darkness I guess maybe kind of you mean like the court magician <laughs> All right, yeah, that one's not so fun at all. A <laughs> well, really? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, but that's nominated for like everything this year. Uh, that was last year. I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was nominated for everything last year, um, which was quite the honor. But. That, that was a fascinating story. It's another one where it's like I had no idea where it was going to go. And it's a the, the concept in it, the, you know, the seed of it is just, it, it just gives you chills. Thank and, you. and what, what led to you to, to come up with that idea of that kind of magic? Uh, that one was the 2016 election. Oh yeah. Okay. Now it makes <laughs> um, sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just, I just needed to, ask the question of of who does some of these things and what drives them and and that was that was why that one was so dark so yeah it's pretty dark yeah. but now i understand it <laughs> that, yeah that was the first first story i wrote after the election yeah okay now now i'm okay with you <laughs> now you know i'm not disturbed by you <laughs> That's a perfectly reasonable response. Um, another one of your stories that really um, I learned something from was uh, Windwell Rove. Because I, I found that fascinating. It's really about how a folk song, it's about, you know, a folk song in the future out in space. And you, I've never seen that before. And I know that comes from, you know, your, your being a musician and, and working on songs. But I got to tell you, that was just a brilliant concept. And just, Thank you. Thank you. and did you, was that, what, is that a f story that you really enjoyed writing? That's one of my favorites. I still owe my mother an apology because at my, uh, at the release for the collection during the Q and A, uh, she asked the question, uh, "Do you have a favorite story?" And um, the guitarist from my band, who was in the room, uh, said, "Kind of called from the back. Did your mother just ask you which of your children is your favorite?" <laughs> Uh, and, and the whole room cracked up and it was a really good excuse not to answer that question, but it was a perfectly valid question. And um, it is hard to pick favorites sometimes, but that one is in some ways a favorite of mine. Um, it has a lot of my, my favorite themes in it, but it was also delight, 
had just delicious to write. It was it was a lot of fun inventing inventing a song uh, and then seeding it through history. And and there, there's a whole lot of other really fun stuff in there. Inventing uh, the all of the entertainments that they created and then and sometimes mangled. Uh, uh, someone the other day noticed the. Uh, that they had changed the ending to Titanic. Um, uh, the the shipboard version of Titanic changed the ending um, because there's room for both of them on that board. Uh, but uh, but anyway, um, yeah yeah. I just write, writing a song like that was a lot of fun. Um, I love that music, and it was fun to. There's a challenge in trying to get someone else's genre right, and. Uh, uh, that that song uh, that story the other the other thing is that I had, I wrote that for um, it was the first time that I got invited to the Sycamore Hill workshop uh, and you know it's this illustrious list of people like when you get the names of who's who you're going to be workshopping peer workshopping with and it's Ted Chang and Karen Joy Fowler and Maureen McHugh and Molly Gloss and uh, you know it's this list of uh, uh, Kelly Link and Gavin Grant and um, uh, this this list that just goes on and on and on and you're like oh my god how am I supposed to do this I just I, and my answer to that question is always well I guess I'm gonna have to write the best story I've ever written um, and and every time I get invited I say well I guess I'm just gonna have to go write the best story I've ever written and then I really push myself so I appreciate that uh, about that but yeah that's something that creative people I think need to do all the time They've, they've got to push themselves and because your stuff is is different you're you know every, when every time I read a new piece by you it's different it's something new and I like that with with writers those are my favorite writers the people where I don't know what I'm going to get when I start reading something mm -hmm. and it's, I think it's something you work at well, I, I, I don't know if you deliberately say it's going to be something different, but you say, what haven't I done before? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I, it, I, I appreciate there's a comfort in, in the, the stories that, that sort of repeat and uh, the people who can write variations on the same novel so that you get to read, you know, the continuing adventures of, I have all the respect in the world for the people who do that. And um, my brain just kind of wants to play with something new. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, something I want to ask you about, because it's, is, is, is titles. Because I love your titles. And it's something I think I'd be terrible at coming up with with titles for things. I mean, you know, like like blur in the corner of your eye and, and song for a new day and and sooner or later everything falls in the sea and it's just great titles of things that fit the book and are evocative. Do you work hard at the titles or do they just come to you at some point? Are they at the beginning? It depends on the title. Some of them come early. Some of them come before the story and want a story to be built around them. Um, sometimes people say something and, and I say, ooh, that's a title. And then either, you know, depending on who it is, you can ask for permission to, to steal what they said and run away with it. Um, and sometimes you get to the end of a story and the working title you had is obviously not the right one. And then you have to kind of push past it and and figure something out yeah it's, it's just fascinating to me so but i'm not a writer so i'm a reader <laughs> yeah there, there's only one that i would rename if i if i had a chance and i'm not going to bother at this point but but uh there's only one that i have to kind of the the way i can tell that i should have i should have like, like it does the thing that I wanted it to do, but I also have trouble connecting it with the story, which says it's probably not the like I probably should have re reached a little harder. Would you say which one it is? Yeah, it, it's um, enjoy knowing the abyss behind, which which I did it for a reason. No one has ever noticed the reason, and it doesn't. 
it doesn't connect well enough for people to to connect it with the story. So, so I think that's the that's the only one that I'm a little uh, not quite as pleased with. Okay, <laughs> reasonable. Yeah. Um, well, we're getting close to out of time, but I want to find out because I'm always interested. What were the influences for you when you were young that that got you to writing? What what who was it that you read when you were young? Um, well, my, my father had the entire run of FNSF and, and lots of collections. So I kept finding, I, like, I kept finding collections and anthologies. Um, before that, I read nothing but horse books. Uh, so, so, you know, in some ways I would have to like credit Walter Farley and Marguerite Henry. Uh, but but beyond that, it was it was uh, Le Guin and Madeline Langle and um, and those usual suspects. Uh, William Slater, um, uh, oh, why am I blanking on his name? Um, the 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 tripods. Uh, uh, John John Wyndham. John Wyndham, yeah. A lot of John Wyndham. Um, the Triffids. Yeah. Yeah, the Triffids, the the Chrysalids, the, all, yeah, all of those. Yeah, I love Wendy. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I liked all of those. Um, uh, so so uh, and and then then just a lot of the like microcosmic tales type of stuff. Um, all of the horse fantastic and dog fantastic uh, anthologies that uh, I think it was Jack Dan. Uh, it might have been was it Jack Dan and Gardner? I, I can't. Uh, it might have been Jack Dan and Gardner as well, but um, there were a whole bunch of anthologies, which were not, in retrospect, really kid anthologies, or you know, they weren't. Uh, if you, if the the dog fantastic, I just remember including like a boy and his dog and stuff. Like it wasn't, it Ooh, wasn't all. Happy, it, it wasn't all happy dog stories. That's not a kid story. No, no, I don't think they were intended for kids um, in retrospect. So. Uh, so you, you yeah. put it all in the soup. Some of it you don't like. You start reading and you realize you shouldn't, and some of it you keep <laughs> reading anyway, and some of it you repress for years, and um, it all comes back sooner or later. Yeah, yeah, and a whole run of FNSF. What a joy! Yeah, yeah. I mean that was, that was always a delight. Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't grow up with that. It would have been that would have been heaven. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're basically kind of out of time and i want to thank you so much for taking time out of your away from your new book to talk with us and i uh, hope everything stays good and safe with you wash thank your hands you. yeah stay, yeah. To stay the hell at home right. my pleasure and it's kind of ironic that we finally get to do this uh, online even though we're only about 45 minutes from each other i know i know we kept trying to get you into the studio but there ain't no studio now yeah so i said well let me just get her on zoom and we can finally talk like we've been wanting to yeah and hopefully we'll get to hang out in a bar at a con again sometimes sometime uh, in the next year or so i sure hope so yeah so thanks anyway this is mike zipser from fast forward saying take care wash your hands <laughs>